Howdy, it's Kyle talking about the field of geography in general. It encompasses a lot more than a lot of people think. And if you're into maps and geography, you probably get tired of people thinking it's just memorizing the capitals to all these places or what's the fourth longest river in Peru as if it's just trivia kind of stuff. And certainly that kind of stuff is part of geography. But to say that geography is just memorizing capitals and places would be like saying that chemistry is just memorizing the periodic table of the elements. So there's a lot more to geography than just memorizing things. And in this video, I'm gonna answer two questions. What is geography and what can I do with a degree in it? This video is primarily intended for three groups of people. One, kids or high school students that are interested in geography but aren't quite sure what they can do with it. Two, college students that aren't quite sure what they want to major in. And three, people that are in the position of hiring that might occasionally see an applicant with a degree in geography. You might ask yourself, what can this person do for me? I'm going to start off with just a general definition of geography as taken from my Penguin Dictionary of Geography Terms from 1973. And according to this book, geography is the subject which describes the Earth's surface, its physical features, climates, vegetation, soils, products, peoples, etc., and their distribution. So yeah, that sounds about right. It's basically just the spatial distribution and variation of various things. They can be just about anything as you're gonna see in this video because everything has a geography to it. There are three main divisions within geography, human, physical, and technical. And each of these three has a series of subdivisions that are part of it. So I'm gonna start off with talking about physical geography and some of the components of it. Within physical geography, there are three primary subdivisions, climatology, geomorphology, and biogeography. Climatology was the subsect of geography that I specialized in when I was an undergrad. It takes a look at the geographic distribution of weather and climate patterns over a long period of time. Meteorology, on the other hand, is the weather at that time, so it's dynamic modeling and forecasting of short-term weather patterns. So a meteorologist might look at radar imagery or upper atmosphere data to determine where a tornado might occur. However, a climatologist would look at long-term tornado trends. So you can look at the shift in Tornado Alley, which used to be more central Great Plains, but now it's moving south and east with Mississippi and Alabama being almost right there with Oklahoma and Kansas. But climatology also deals with air pollution. So for example, my senior thesis in college involved looking at the air pollution numbers for the San Fernando Valley part of Los Angeles and comparing that to the particulate matter air pollution of the San Joaquin Valley that's a couple of hours north of there. And in graduate school at South Carolina, I looked more at hurricane type stuff, being that you get a lot of hurricanes in the state. And so my knowledge of hurricanes and climatology in the southeast is what landed me a job with the South Carolina Emergency Management Division dealing with hurricane and other weather preparedness and response. Another part of climatology is paleoclimatology, which looks at long-term climate trends across the globe. So paleoclimatologists are the people that are talking about global climate change or global warming kind of stuff and the long-term effects of this, how it's happened and how it's going to get worse. So there's quite a bit of stuff you can do with studying climatology, but now I want to get into another subject of physical geography and that's geomorphology. Geomorphology is the study of physical features and the relationship of those physical features with the underlying geology. So a geologist might go into the physics and chemistry of why a certain landform was created, and the geomorphologist might look at how and why these certain features are located in certain places. But also in respect to global climate change, a geomorphologist might look at glacial retreating in alpine areas. Or a geomorphologist might take a look at coastal erosion and look at how that's affected the beach and the surrounding coastal areas. So there's definitely some overlap between geology and geomorphology, but there are also some differences as well. And the third part of physical geography that I'm going to discuss is biogeography. And this involves a geographic distribution of animals and plants. Biogeography can include studying migratory patterns of various animals, places that are most hospitable for various species, deforestation, desertification, or how human interactions affect species distribution and genetic diversity. So oftentimes biogeographers are the ones involved with environmental impact studies. So if there's a new construction going on or some type of new pipeline or building or development or whatever it is, a biogeographer will be involved to see what kind of impact that new development might have on the surrounding environment. 
There are two subsets of geography that straddle the line between human and physical. The first is natural resource management and sustainable energy. And a lot of this has to do with water conservation and water management. And you may be aware of the Aral Sea, which lies between Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan in Central Asia. And this is considered one of the worst man-made environmental disasters ever. This once giant lake has been reduced to a very small fraction of what it once was. And this is all due to poor water resource management and unsustainable irrigation. And in the U.S., we have something called the Ogallala Aquifer, which is a large aquifer that has been rapidly depleting in recent years. I'm not going to get into the details of it, but the recent population growth in Texas has increased the depletion of the Ogallala Aquifer. And this is very important stuff, but oftentimes the scientists are silenced by politicians that don't want people to hear just how bad the situation is. And the other subset that straddles the line between physical and human geography is the study of hazards. And these can involve natural disasters to include tornadoes, hurricanes, earthquakes, and floods, but also man-made disasters including chemical spills and terrorist attacks. Flooding is the biggest concern in terms of natural hazards, and floodplain management is an important part of hazards research. And part of this includes vulnerability, which is taking a look at the highest risk populations and how their underlying geography affects the fact that they are at higher risk. And a lot of the folks that I went to graduate school with at the University of South Carolina are now employed in the field of environmental hazard research and consulting. Next, I want to discuss human geography, and this can involve many different aspects, including cultural studies, regional studies, economic geography, urban structure and land use planning, medical stuff, transportation. So things that have to do with the human landscape on the earth falls under human geography. Urban geography is the study of cities, and this includes urban structure and land use planning. So if a developer has a plan for a new stadium or arena or some kind of condo development, an urban geographer will take a look at how this new development could affect the surrounding city. This can include walkability, livability, cost of living, public transportation, and crime. If you want to check out some pretty cool detailed stuff about city planning and urban geography, check out the YouTube channel City Beautiful. It's a great channel and the guy is such a nerd. He's really knowledgeable in this kind of stuff. A lot of urban geography also includes stuff to do with transportation geography. So under transportation geography, things that might be studied are congestion choke points and how to improve them, how to improve public transit routes or where to add them, or things such as bridge placement. And this is especially important for big cities where there's a large number of pedestrians, cyclists, private vehicles, and buses. But it also includes transport in terms of trade. So, for example, heavy and low-value goods are often manufactured near a port. It wouldn't be economically feasible to transport heavy things across the country then to ship them out. And that's why you have so many clothes manufacturers and condiment manufacturers in Los Angeles. Things are low-value but heavy can be made right there and immediately shipped out. And this spills right into economic geography, which covers economic regionalization and development. An economist might come up with a hypothesis that might deal with how to improve the economy of a certain area, but a geographer will take a look at where those economic policies were implemented and whether or not they worked. So in many of my videos, I'll talk about how wages, taxes, and overall cost of living can have an effect on the surrounding area. And that way you can get a better feel of how certain economic policies and ideals work or fail in different places. Also within human and economic geography is site selection analysis. And this is research on a given area to help determine best places for a location of a new small business or, if you're a large company, expanding locations. And there's a lot that goes into site selection analysis. It's not just simply picking a busy street corner. Something that's been very important recently has been the field of health geography. And these are people that study the spatial variation of diseases and correlation with human and physical geography but it can also be used to examine the spatial distribution of a pandemic. And they can take a look at correlations between where a pandemic is spreading and compare that to age, gender, location, income, etc. And this will give a pretty good indication of how a pandemic is affecting a certain area versus other areas. So there are quite a few important applications that are involved with human geography. And the third subset I'm going to discuss is technical geography. And this involves using computers, software or other equipment to enhance geographic knowledge and there are three major parts of technical geography these include geographic information systems or gis remote sensing and surveying 
geographic information systems is huge right now and is probably the largest sector of employment for geographers. And one of the big reasons for this is that it includes just about everything I discussed previously in this video, but depicts it in a map form. And so GIS will take a look at a base map and show all kinds of layers on top of it showing different types of information that is pertinent to whatever that study is. So it can be hydrology or climatology or urban geography or transportation planning, all depicted in a map. So say you're a real estate developer and you're trying to determine the best spot to locate a new development. So you might very well be looking at site selection analysis visualized through GIS. So you can take a look at the base layer map of a city to include roads and buildings. You can overlay that with a map of income levels for various parts of the city. You can look at bus stops and bike paths in different pedestrian friendly areas, the age range of people that are located in different neighborhoods, the crime rate of various parts of town, and many more indicators to help determine where would be the best spot in town to locate whatever you're trying to locate. But that's just one example of the many things you can do with GIS and why it's so popular. Another major aspect of geographical techniques is remote sensing, which is the analysis of satellite imagery and aerial photography. And there are many applications for remote sensing, including land use analysis, observing oceans and other wilderness areas you can't get to very easily, defense strategies and espionage to look at what are other countries up to, and something else important for remote sensing is looking at how things have changed over time, so aerial photography or satellite imagery of the same place several years apart. And with radar and LIDAR, you can see outside the normal electromagnetic Roy G. Bibb spectrum. And another aspect of technical geography is geodetic surveying. And this involves ground level and topography mapping that might be at a greater resolution than what you can get from remote sensing. So you'll often see people like road surveyors using the laser theodolite type things, but there's a lot more to geodetic surveying than just that. And there are many applications of this, including field level observation of changing topography and looking at how meanderings and rivers can create oxbows. So I think that the way things are going overall high tech, not just in geography, but everything else, this section of geography probably has the most employment opportunities for you, especially in GIS and remote sensing. So that's my overview of what geography is and what kind of things you can do with it if you've been studying it. And like I was saying at the beginning, it's often frustrating to hear people think it's just, oh, wow, you know, the capital of North Dakota, big deal. But there's so much more to it than that. And if you're hiring somebody who has a degree in geography, just think of all the wonderful things they might know. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please give me a thumbs up to let me know you approve and subscribe to this channel if you're interested in learning more about geography. I'm usually talking about the U.S., but I'll dabble into Canada, Mexico, and the Caribbean. And I'm ranking things, comparing and contrasting cities and states in all kinds of different categories, and talking about cross-country road tripping. Everything I talk about is from a little more nerdy type perspective. But yeah, thanks for watching. Geography King, signing out.